Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're going to be continuing our discussion on neural networks with maybe the most important topic in neural networks, at least in my opinion, which is the vanishing gradient problem. And let me tell you why I think it's the most important topic. When we talk about any machine learning model or method, it's of course important to talk about its strengths and when you should use it. But I think it's equally, maybe even more so important to talk about its weaknesses when you should not use it, what things can go wrong. I think this is especially true with neural networks because of the hype that we have around neural networks. Of course, there's people who understand them well, study them diligently, but there's also tons of people who are just on this hype train for neural networks. And so with anything like that, it's especially important to understand where things can go wrong. So what I'll assume coming into this video is two things, that you generally know what a neural network is. So if you look at this picture behind me, you know exactly what's going on step by step. And you also understand what backpropagation is and how it works and what it's for. So understanding those two things would be great. I have videos on both of these topics. I'll link in the description below. Um, if you need to go watch those and come back, it'll be a better experience for you. So of course we have this neural network back here and I can walk you through at a very, very high level what's going on. We have our inputs, x, so x is some kind of vector. We apply a linear transformation to x, which is called w0, that gets us to a new vector called z1. We apply an element-wise activation function to z1, which is called sigma, in order to get to the first hidden vector, h1, and then we just rinse and repeat. So these two things, z1 and h1 together, make up what's called the first hidden layer. To get to the next hidden layer, we apply some other linear transformation w1. We apply the element-wise activation function again so that we get to h2. This is the second hidden layer. And we can do this as many times as we want till we get to the kth hidden layer. And the last things that will happen in this network are that we apply some final linear transformation to get to zk plus 1. We apply the activation function one more time to get to p hat which is a predicted probability. So we're just gonna assume we're using this network for a binary classification problem today, but everything we're saying applies to anything, basically. And once we have our predicted probability, we wanna, of course, know is this a good or bad estimation for the true quantity? And to do that, we calculate a loss function. So that loss function for us is just the squared loss, p hat minus y uh, squared, y being the true label, either zero or one. We apply a one half here just to make the math easier. And so this is the general architecture of a neural network. And of course, the follow-up question, which we answered in the backpropagation video, is how do I get good, correct values for all these weight vectors, w0, w1, and on and on? Because we initialize them randomly, but of course, that's going to be pretty much garbage output. We want some systematic way we can use in order to update all these weight vectors so that at the end of the day, they contain weights that are actually useful for us to solve this problem. And we know the answer is backpropagation. And the key to understanding backpropagation, again, is uh, yes, the chain rule, but more explicitly, just understanding how we can walk from the beginning of the neural network to the end of the neural network, understanding what's changing what, and then what changes next, and so on. So to give you a concrete example here, let's say we want to know what's the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to the first set of weights, w0. If I knew this, then I could use this answer in order to successfully update these weights, w0 using basically gradient descent. And so how do I get this? So we know it's not like a direct update. W0 is here at the beginning of the network and the loss function is here at the end of the network. So it's not a direct update. So instead we walk through the network step by step and each time we write down the term so that at the end of the day we have a big product, yes, which is the chain rule technically. But a better way to think about it is that we are telling the story about how a small change here eventually gets propagated to this change in the loss function. And so for example, just to start the story, the first thing that would happen is these weights change z1, then z1 would change h1, h1 would change z2, and so on and so on and so on. So that's the nature of this giant product you're seeing. Now this product looks a little bit unwieldy, it looks like there's tons of terms in here. But to help simplify it a little bit, we can notice that there's actually only four distinct types of terms. The easiest two to talk about are the one at the very beginning and the one at the very end because they're unique. So the one at the very beginning is the change in z1 with respect to our variable of interest, which is w0. The other unique one is the one at the very end, which is the change in the loss function itself with respect to the predicted probability. We don't even need to compute them for this video. We just need to know that those are two unique terms. And so everything else in the middle all these other terms in this product, there may seem like there's lots of them, but they form a very nice alternating pattern of only two types of terms. 
And so the first of those two types is a Z affecting an H in the same layer. For example, this term here, bracketed in green, this other term bracketed in green, this other term bracketed in green, or it's a change in a Z which is caused by an H in the previous layer. So for example, DZ2, DH1. So that corresponds to this uh, connection right here. Or for example, DZK plus one, DHK. So that corresponds to uh, this connection right here. So we don't need to worry about those. We're only gonna be worrying today about the terms bracketed in green that's going to help us understand this vanishing gradient problem. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these terms bracketed in green. What are they? Where are they in the network? For example, where is dh1, dz1? So that is of course right here, where we're going from a z vector, applying element-wise activation functions in order to get to the first hidden vector. Another such instance is here, which is dh2, dz2. And that's the exact same thing. It's just happening in the second hidden layer. We're going from some z vector, applying element-wise activation functions, sigma, in order to get to the second hidden vector. So we see the nature of each of these green bracketed terms is going from a z vector to the hidden vector by applying an element-wise activation function to each of those numbers. And the very convenient thing is, so up until now we've been assuming this activation function is a sigmoid, so let's continue assuming that for now. How do we find the derivative of a sigmoid with respect to its input? We know this from many of our previous videos, but most explicitly from the video we had on the sigmoid itself. I'll link that in the description below, but the key insight to know is that, for example, if I have a sigmoid, so of course we know one thing is bounded between zero and one, it's part of the reason we use it in the first place. If we have a sigmoid, which is this S-shaped curve here, we know that its derivative is conveniently given by the value of the sigmoid, times one minus the value of the sigmoid. And that's what you're seeing here. We have the value of the sigmoid, h1, times one minus the value of the sigmoid. And it's the same for each of these guys. If it seems like I pulled this fact out of thin air, I don't blame you if you've never seen this before. But take a minute to convince for yourself. You can even uh, derive this algebraically. It's not super hard. You can write out the mathematical form of the sigmoid, take the derivative, and you'll be able to see this for yourself. So now that we have this, to begin seeing where the vanishing gradient problem comes in, we ask ourselves this. Are these forms, which is like h1 times one minus h1, h2 times one minus h2, and so on, are they bounded by anything? Is there some number that they cannot be greater than? And it seems like yes, because the sigmoid is bounded between zero and one, which means that each of these h1s, h2s, hks, uh, this p hat, by the way, is the same type of term. It just has a p hat. But you could have just as easily called this hk plus 1 instead, if that makes you feel a little better. So each of these has to be bounded between 0 and 1. And you can solve this either using calculus, or you can kind of just intuitive this. You can see that if you have a thing like p hat times 1 minus p hat, and p hat has to be between 0 and 1, the biggest this thing can ever be is if p hat is equal to 1 half. In that case, we have 1 half times one minus one half, so it's basically one half squared, or one quarter, one out of four. You can convince yourself that no other output of the sigmoid can give you anything higher. For example, if you take uh, something close to one half, like 0.4, then you have 0.4 times one minus 0.4, so 0.4 times 0.6 gives you 0.24, which is less than 0.25. So you can see why the biggest each of these quantities could be is one fourth. Okay, so that's what I filled in here. This is less than or equal to one fourth. This is less than or equal to one fourth. Each of these green bracketed terms within this product is less than or equal to one fourth. And now let me pause for a second for the very mathematical among you who are uh, thinking this. So uh, for example, look at this guy, dh1, dz1. What is z1? It's a vector. What is h1? It's a vector. So we're taking a partial derivative of a vector with respect to a vector. So you're saying, Wait, that's going to be a matrix, not a number. How can you say that a whole matrix is less than or equal to one fourth? Uh, I commend you. This is absolutely correct. And so what I'm doing here is a little bit of an abuse of notation. But it still holds because this matrix we're talking about is going to be a diagonal matrix. Why is it a diagonal matrix? Because notice that when I drew this diagram, I very explicitly did not put these cross connections that you see between H's and Z's because, as I've been saying, these are element-wise activation functions. And the easiest way to say that is that actually the first element here only affects the first element in H. 
the second element in Z only affects the second element in H. There's no cross connections going on. And therefore the matrix for each of these DH, DZs is going to be a diagonal matrix because each element in Z is only affecting its corresponding element in H, not any of the others. The derivative with any of the others would be exactly zero. And each element on this diagonal does obey this less than or equal to one quarter. So if you want to get technical about it, yes, these are all matrices and each element in that matrix is less than or equal to one quarter. And so this is a bit of an abusive notation, but all the conclusions we draw will be the same. Okay, so now that we understand that, let's ask ourselves a follow-up question. We know each of these guys individually is less than or equal to one quarter. What about their product? So to understand that, we just need to know how many of them there are. So there are one, two, k, and there's another one here at k plus one. So there's k plus one things, each of which is less than or equal to one quarter. So their product, the product of these k plus one terms, has to be less than or equal to one quarter to the power of k plus one. And that's exactly what I've written right here. Now here is the key part of the video, where the vanishing gradient problem comes in. k is again the number of hidden layers we have. So as we increase the number of hidden layers, which is analogous to increasing the depth of the network or the complexity of the network, we may do this because we want to be able to handle more obscure data sets, more abstract data sets. Maybe a small number of hidden layers isn't doing it for us, whatever reason. As we increase the number of hidden layers k, this quantity, 1 fourth to the power of k plus 1, decreases exponentially because every time you have another hidden layer, the exponent will go up by one, therefore the whole thing will get divided by four each time. So it's not decreasing linearly or anything like that. This is an exponential decay. And what that means is that this product is going lower and lower and lower and lower. So we see this product here, which is given by these scientific notation numbers. So this product is going lower and lower and lower and lower so that at some point we are going to reach such a small decimal number that our computer can't handle it and basically just resolves it to be zero. Let's think about what happens if that is the case. If our computer can no longer handle the precision of this number, it's getting way too low, and it just resolves it to zero, then this whole product will be zero, which means that the derivative of the loss function with respect to w zero is going to be zero. And what that tells us is that when it comes time to do the gradient and descent, there's no reason to change w zero because from the computer's point of view, it has no effect on the loss function and therefore these weights do not change. And you can see where this is going. If these first set of weights are not changing and stay at their randomly initialized values, then it's basically just taking your inputs, scrambling it into garbage, and no matter how good the rest of the network might be, it's not going to be able to give you a good prediction because the very first hidden layer is basically just taking your network, scrambling it into garbage and passing that garbage along, garbage in, garbage out, right? So the big problem here is that the early layers of the network cannot learn. And I wanna make another point here, which is that, remember, this is just an upper bound. If you look at the sigmoid, that is assuming the best case scenario, where you have exactly an input of zero, leading to an output of one half, which leads to a derivative of one fourth. Typically, you're probably gonna have values that are not exactly there. For example, if your input is here, the derivative right here is actually very low. It's close to zero. And that's gonna make this problem much, much worse because you no longer have a one fourth here. You might have something like a 0.1 or a 0.01, which is just going to increase the speed at which your computer can no longer handle these very, very small numbers and resolve them to exactly zero. And you don't even need like 16 hidden layers. This could happen in three or four hidden layers, for example. But the point I want to get across is that the vanishing gradient problem happens when we try to compute derivatives like this, the change in the loss function with respect to the change in some weight in our network. But we are getting values that are either exactly zero, if our computer truly just can't handle these numbers anymore, or are so small that we're not changing these weights. So even if the computer could handle these numbers, if this is small enough, if this becomes small enough, we're making basically minuscule changes to this weight. And so maybe it's getting better extremely slowly, but it's not going to be anywhere we want within any reasonable amount of time. And so that is the vanishing gradient problem, which is that as your network gets longer and longer, gets more complex, each of these early weights has to go through so many connections in the network, so many sigmoids, so that the effect that those early weights have on the eventual loss becomes so small that we can't learn those early weights anymore. 
And that's the vanishing gradient problem. Now let's round out the video by talking high level about some of the solutions that people have come up to deal with the vanishing gradient problem. Of course, there are solutions. We use neural networks all over the place these days. So there's got to be something people did about it. And so I'll just talk about three families of solutions and talk about the pros and cons briefly. The first one is much of this is because we've been choosing to use the sigmoid. And the biggest issue with the sigmoid, at least for the vanishing gradient problem, is that it saturates in both directions. What I mean is that if we go in the negative direction, the derivative approaches pretty much zero. If we go really far in the positive direction, the derivative approaches basically zero. And it's those very low close to zero derivatives which end up having a part in this product which leads to the eventual gradients being zero, which leads to us not updating any of our early layers. So what if we just don't use the sigmoid activation function? We haven't made a video on activation functions yet. I think I will. But suffice to say that sigmoid is not the only choice you have for your activation function. Another one people like to use is called ReLU, which is, uh, stands for rectified linear units. We can get to that when we talk about that in its own video. But the most important thing to understand is the shape of it. The shape of it, uh, let me draw it in squiggles. It's actually zero for anything that's less than zero. And then if you have an input that's greater than zero, it has a slope of one. So it just looks like this. Now, oh, let me draw that in squiggles. Now, why would this help solve part of the problem? You can see on the uh, negative part of the inputs, it doesn't actually help at all because those gradients are still actually in this case exactly zero. So you're gonna have the vanishing gradient problem there. But if you look at the positive part here, while the sigmoid saturates, its derivative approaches zero, the derivative of the ReLU is always equal to one. A slope is exactly one. And so you won't have the vanishing gradient problem on that side. And so this is one correction people will often make. Another very, very clever solution is called the ResNet or residual network. Uh, part of the issue too is that if we think about updating this weight, we saw that we have tons of steps to go through before we finally reach the loss function. So another way of saying that is that information from the beginning of the network is going through so many steps that it's barely participating. It barely carries through to the end of the network. And so the easiest patch on that is to draw direct arrows from the beginning of the network to somewhere deeper later in the network. And so what that would look like is saying that uh, let this architecture stay as it is, but draw a couple of extra arrows so that for example, things from H1 have a direct connection to, for example, zk plus one. And so what we're doing there is we're basically saying h1 can still contribute to zk plus one through the typical route where it has to go through all these hidden layers, but we give it a second way to contribute directly, which is saying that actually you can also contribute directly to zk plus one. And how did this help solve the vanishing gradient problem? Of course, if the gradient in the main part of the network still vanishes, that's possible but we are much less likely to see the gradient that's associated with this new arrow, which only has one step to go through vanish. Because remember, this exponential decay occurs because of the number of hidden layers we have to go through. So if we give it a way to get directly from the beginning to the end of the network, we reduce k here basically and reduce the possibility for a vanishing gradient. And the final uh, way of people dealing with this I'll talk about is called LSTM. This is actually part of recurrent neural networks or RNNs, which we'll have videos for as well. And so we're not gonna go into that in this video, but suffice to say LSTMs do a similar uh, spirit of things that residual neural networks, this connecting the beginning to the end, what they're trying to do, except instead of having these explicit arrows, they still only have information passing from one hidden layer to the next. They have this special what's called a carry state, which is allowed to pass from the beginning to the end of the network unchanged if that's beneficial to the neural network. And we can talk way more about that when we talk about a whole video on LSTMs. But the spirit of this solution is that we're going to be allowing the network to somehow retain key information from the beginning to the end of the network without it vanishing. And so that's the vanishing gradient problem. Again, I think it's very important to understand it because it is one of these big issues with neural networks that people have had to find a way to deal with. And if you're not careful, you can run into it yourself if you try to implement a neural network for yourself, for example. So if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.